um, through science. So uh, be sure to look into that. Would you find in your Bibles John chapter 5? We're going to go there here in just a moment. But if you're looking into the scriptures for a description of a godly woman, Proverbs 31 is where you would most likely land. It's a wonderful text of scripture talking about wife and mother, a virtuous woman, it says there. And in chapter 31, it's 22 verses long, this section from verse 10 through the end of the chapter. And it's an acrostic that this, the poet put together. An acrostic, of course, is a, a series of letters that mean something. The word NASA is an acrostic, National Aeronautic and Space Administration. So in that acrostic, in Scripture, there's a lot of acrostics. If you're reading through the book of Psalms or Lamentations, if you find a chapter in Psalms with 22 verses, most likely that is an acrostic psalm, meaning that in Hebrew language, they took the first letter of Hebrew, Aleph, and they made the first verse start with that letter. And then they took the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Beth, and started that verse with that, took the third letter and fourth and such. And the poet did that here for uh, in Pro uh, Proverbs 31, verse, starting in verse 10 and continuing through the end of the chapter. So, for example, in chapter, uh, verse 10 of Proverbs 31, it says there that who can find a virtuous woman? Her worth is far above rubies. So it elevates a woman and a woman of character. Man, that's hard to find. But what's fascinating in the chapter is the, the poet calls witnesses to the stand, if you will, to affirm this woman. For example, in verse 28, it speaks about the children speaking well of their mom and then uh, the husband speaking well. It says, the children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. So here's this uh, godly woman, virtuous woman, and there are uh, witnesses called to the stand, if you will, to say her children are saying good things about her, her husband's saying good things about her. In fact, in verse 11 of that chapter, it says that her husband, uh, the heart of her husband safely trusts in her, so he'll have no lack of gain. So again, the husband has this confidence in uh, his wife. Not only that, the community speaks well of her. There's this testimony of the community about what a godly woman. In verse 23, uh, her husband sits in the gates, and the gates were kind of where city council met, where all the important transactions happened. They'd go to the gates. Her husband's known in the gates and when he sits among the elders of the land. But the husband's known in a significant way because of the character and influence of this godly woman. He's known in the gates. So the community celebrates. Also in the chapter, her own works speak for themselves. Her own works. It's in verse 13, 14, uh, verse 25. For example, uh, strength and honor are her clothing. Uh, she rejoices in time to come. It speaks about her making clothes for her kids and keeping them warm, and she considers property and buys property. A very dramatic text of Scripture where her own works praise her. Uh, her character speaks for itself. Now, there wasn't social media, of course, when the book of Proverbs was written. But the text tells us she's not trumpeting from the rooftops how great she is. She's letting her works speak for themselves. She's letting her family speak for themselves. And then her own words. I love the next verse in verse 26 of Proverbs 31, where it says, uh, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Wouldn't it be great if we could open our mouth and wisdom comes out? Kindness comes out. Absolutely. So ladies, uh, mothers, we commend you today. We celebrate your role and your influence. The point of Proverbs 31 isn't to intimidate, but to inspire. And to say, that's a goal. That's where I want to be. That's who, the kind of person I want to be. Now this leads us perfectly into John chapter 5. And our study of John as we continue that. Because in John chapter 5, 
Jesus is speaking and he calls witnesses to speak on his behalf. Last week we looked at a section of John chapter 5 where Jesus made bold statements about himself. He said, I am equal with God. He said, I'm the giver of life and I will raise the dead and I'm the final judge. I determine man's destiny. He made these bold statements about himself. But then we come to verse 31 and he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true or valid. If it's just me saying these things, that's not enough. Now, Jesus would be enough, but he's saying there's more witnesses than that. Now, when it comes to a trial, lawyers tend to think about three kinds of witnesses. They think about eyewitnesses who actually saw it happen. They think about expert witnesses that are called in, and here's how the foundation of the building should have been built, and it wasn't built that way, and you know, the person is responsible. Expert witnesses. And then there's character witnesses. That person that I, uh, you know, I know, they would never do this. They're not capable of this. They're not capable. And so what Jesus does, after he lays out those five statements about himself, I am this, and I am this, and I am this, then he says, let me have others bring testimony to say and affirm just what I'm telling you. Now, the word witness or testimony is a key word in the Gospel of John. If you're reading through the book of John, I encourage you to find and look for, underline, mark, make a note. Every time you come to the word witness or testimony or testify. Because John's trying to answer the question, who are you about Jesus? And he's answering that by bringing witnesses and testimony to help answer that question. So today I want to look at um, witnesses for Christ. Who is it that Jesus would bring forth as evidence to validate what he's saying? So in verse 32, for example, he says, There's another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. So the first witness that Christ puts forth is John the Baptist. John the baptizer. That's different than the disciple John or the one that wrote the gospel of John. Jesus is saying, I'm, don't just take my word for it. Here's John the Baptist. You know, when uh, people are signing a marriage license, there's a place for witnesses to sign. Well, the bride or the groom, they aren't signing as witnesses, right? They got to get somebody else to do it. Some of you here are, are notaries. You can't witness yourself signing something. The role of a notary is to be the witness. And so Jesus is saying, don't take my word for it. Let me show you the witness of John the Baptist. And Jesus says five things about the message of John the Baptist that are very important. For example, in verse 32, he says... John there, bears witness of me, and that witness which he witnesses is true. So the first thing we're going to note about John's testimony is that it is agreeable with reality. It aligns, it matches reality. How do you know if something is true or not? Well, you just look at reality. Does it line up or not? We hear so many things today about my truth and my opinion and we look at it, we, that doesn't match reality. Then that doesn't make it true. We know that the sky is blue because that matches reality. We know that there are two genders because that matches reality. Right down to the cellular level, the chromosomal level, there's two genders. That's easy because it aligns with reality. And John the Baptist had testimony about who Jesus was because it aligns with reality. And John said, here's the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who takes away the sin of the world. That corresponds with reality. So there's your test, by the way. Is this true or not? Does it match reality? Uh, that job's getting tougher, by the way, because there's something called artificial intelligence that's coming along. And we're not sure what we are seeing and reading, if it's real or not. So we're going to have to really put... The to the test um, 
Is it true? Does it match reality? A second comment about John in verse 33, Jesus said, you sent to John and he has borne witness to the truth. They sent people to John to investigate John. And the first chapter of the gospel of John, there's people coming to John the Baptist and they're like, who are you? And he said, I'm not the Christ. Who are you? And he said, I'm not the prophet. I'm not the coming Messiah. Who are you then? They keep asking him, who are you? Trying to figure it out. He was carefully scrutinized. But they sent to John. They kept asking. A third one, I like this one, verse 34. Jesus said, I did not receive testimony from man, but I say these things to you that you might be saved. What Jesus was saying was, John the Baptist isn't defining me. I'm the son of God. I'm already defined. I'm self-contained. I'm self-explained. I don't need John to prove who I am. It's for all of you listeners. It's for all of the people watching. Jesus said it's so that you'll be saved. It's so that you can dial in there. Jesus is self-defined. Now, we live in an age when people are trying to define themselves, to make up their identity. And social media, of course, plays a significant role in that. It's count of likes and views and impressions. And so many people are, being, uh, are seeking to define themselves in those kinds of ways. And it's fascinating the levels of anxiety and depression and mental health concerns that have grown out of um, the rise of social media. A fascinating book that I'm just about halfway through, The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt, uh, explores that. He's not a Christian man, but he explores the rise of uh, cell phones and instant internet connectivity with the mental health issues that are going on in young people and into adulthood. The reason is that people are building their, their lives and their identities on what other people think, on what's going on outside of them. And Jesus teaches us here. He's secure in who he is because he knows who he is. And the whole point of asking the question, who are you, is to find out who Christ is. But then we understand ourselves better when we start with him, when we find our identity in him. Then we find out who we are. But far too many live life like, in the beginning, I define myself. In the beginning, me. And that's not where it starts. That's not where the world started. That's not where the universe started. It started with God. And only in Jesus Christ, when we find our identity there, can we then begin to make sense of who we are. Jesus said that uh, the testimony of John about Jesus was to save those people. Think of the, the grief, the anxiety, the depression that is saved, that saves, uh, that we're saved from when we know who Jesus is. When we understand who we are in him, when we start with him and then find our identity there. Another thing about John, verse 35, he was the burning and shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in the light. So Jesus is still talking to us about John's message. And he says that John was a lamp, not the light. The light is the original source. Jesus is the light of the world. John was reflecting that. He was projecting that by how he lived. He was the lamp. Can I say that this should take a lot of pressure off of us. Because we're not running the universe. We're not in charge. You and I aren't holding the planets up there in space. It's not our job to keep it revolving. It's almost like God designed sleep just to remind us that for one third of the day, we aren't in charge of anything. A few nights ago, um, the heavy rains were still going on, you know, and uh, I woke up one morning and uh, it was one of those three or four inch gushers, you know. I slept through the whole thing. Didn't hear a thing. 
And I got up and I said, well, I guess the weather guessers missed it again. How they, and I'm looking outside and I, finally I looked at the rain gauge and it's like two or three inches. What happened? Terry got up. Did you hear the thunder? No. Didn't hear a thing. It's almost like God designed sleep so that we could just relax a little bit and realize this universe isn't depending on us to run it. John was a lamp, not the light. He wasn't the originator of anything. The humility that comes with that. Related terminology in the first chapter of of. John's gospel, John the Baptist calls himself a voice, not the word. Again, he's just communicating the message. He's not the message. It's not about him. He's a voice. That's it. (laughs) One more comment from Jesus about John and the people sent there. Look at the end of 35. You were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. You got on the bandwagon and then you got off just as fast, people. That's what Jesus is saying. You know, there's something about light. It attracts and then it exposes. Which part of those two do you like? We like the attraction part, right? Wow, that's nice. Let, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Let's go see where the light is. What's the light that's shining? But the closer we get to the light, the more is revealed or exposed about our flaws and our shortcomings and our sin. And so there's a lot of us that are drawn, how's it say it? For a time, we rejoice in the light. And tragically, people come so far with God, and then they're like, you know what, we'll take it from here. It got us over the hump. It got me over the edge, and now I think I can handle it from here on out. God, thanks. You got me past Wednesday. We're over the hard part, and we can go on. Willing for a time. Jesus kind of gets pointed there. It's a great warning to us about being short timers. That our faith in Christ, we want it to be evidenced by our perseverance, our continuing on. John the Baptist is a powerful character witness for Jesus. But Jesus isn't done calling witnesses to the stand. Look at verse 36. He has another witness. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, those bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So Jesus said, don't take my word for it. Here's John the Baptist and what he said. And you all carefully scrutinized him. But everything he said squares with reality. But then he says, there's more evidence. Just look at what I do. He turned water into wine, showing that quality was not an issue for him. He raised a, a crippled man who'd been crippled for 38 years, showing that length of time of the problem is not any problem for him. He healed a boy from 20 miles away, showing the distance wasn't any problem for him in John chapter 4. Next week's message is going to be about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Showing that quantity is no issue for him. The week or two after that, it's going to be about Jesus calming the storm and walking on water. No nature issue is a problem for him. Jesus' own works. A man named Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. It's in chapter 3 of the Gospel of John in verse 2. And uh, this man came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi... We know that you're a teacher who's come from God. For nobody can do the signs, the miracles that you're doing unless God's with them. The miracles of Jesus speak for themselves and give powerful testimony to who Jesus is. But he's not done. John the Baptist, the works that I do. He's got another one in verse 37 and 38. 
and the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom, he's, because whom he sent him you do not believe. Him you do not believe. So he calls God the Father as a witness. There were three different times in Jesus' earthly ministry when God the Father's voice boomed from heaven to earth for those who were listening. This is my beloved son at Jesus' baptism when he came up out of the water. The voice of the Father, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then at the Mount of Transfiguration, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17. This is my beloved son. Listen to what he's saying. And then after the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, But the people weren't listening. They weren't hearing. They weren't paying attention. So Jesus has another witness that he calls. It's in verse 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which speak of me. Verse 40. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. The fourth witness Jesus calls here is the scriptures themselves. And he says, these Old Testament scriptures speak of me. They're pointing the way for me. We picked up a saying that goes like this. The Bible is a unified story that points to Jesus. When you read through the Old Testament scriptures, those are not random stories. There's David and Goliath. There's Daniel in the lion's den. There's Noah in the ark. Those aren't just random stories. Those are all part of a plan of God to point the way to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now it says here, you search the scriptures. He's not commanding them to search the scriptures. He's just explaining, this is a fact. You guys have been studying the scriptures for, for those people for decades and uh, Jewish people for centuries there. You've been searching the scriptures and you've missed the whole point of them. They're pointing people to me. In the Gospel of John, there's at least 18 times where the Old Testament is quoted or alluded to when John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's a throwback to the Passover Lamb. Look at verse 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. But if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Jesus is saying, Moses was writing about me. You see, all the references to the Passover lamb were pointing to who Jesus Christ is. He out of slavery in Egypt. And it was a reminder of the deliverance and the freedom that was going to come when people put their hearts and lives into Jesus Christ's hands. In John chapter 6, it'll be a few weeks before we study about Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. And he's actually going to say, the manna that came down from heaven, that was just a picture to create a longing for me in your life. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And I lay down my life for my sheep. Maybe you know that verse in Psalms where it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I lack nothing. What Jesus was saying here is you all have been looking into the scriptures and they're pointing to me, but you've been missing it. You've been missing it. So there's some implications. Let me offer three implications from this. Implication number one is when you read Scripture, when you're reading the Old Testament, look for Jesus. When you're reading through the Old Testament, how is this pointing to Christ? You know, one of the ways it points to Christ is we read about the deeply flawed individuals and we keep longing, is there anybody that can get this right? Is there anybody that can live a perfect life? Is there anybody that can finally show us what it looks like to live with character? It creates a longing. Sometimes their symbols are pictures. The serpent on the pole. Look to the serpent on the pole and you will live. 
the manna from heaven. Strike the rock and water will come flowing out of that. And Jesus said in John 4 to the woman at the well, when you put your faith in me, it's going to be like rivers of water in your life. It's not just Noah and the flood. It's a picture of salvation. There's only one door in to the ark of salvation. It's not just David and Goliath, a random story. It's somebody fighting on our behalf, taking on the giant that is Satan. Secondly, implication here. Jesus' redeeming work was planned by God. Jesus' redeeming work was planned by God. As we read through the Old Testament, we, and then we connect it to the New Testament, we realize this was all a plan. It wasn't like Jesus' earthly ministry, something went awry. Something went haywire. Oh, no, they're getting mad at him. That's not what we expected at all. We thought it would all be great. It was all a plan. First Peter has a fascinating phrase. The, uh, we were redeemed by the lamb who was slain. Before the foundation of the world. Before God even created the world, he had a plan to redeem the world. He had a plan to save us from our sin. It was all a plan. God's not surprised. God's not caught off guard. He's not surprised. Now this uh, week has been an interesting week at the Perkins household. Uh, my wife had hip replacement surgery uh, a year ago next week. And at the time of that surgery, the doctor said, which hip do you want to do first? They're both bad. And she said, well, the right one started hurting first, so we'll do that one. Okay, then a year later, meaning like next week, we'll do the other one. So we've been working on this and planning. Uh, the other day, Terry was walking into school, and she stumbled and she said, oh, no, my foot hurts. And by the end of the day, she couldn't walk on it. And she broke her foot and uh, on the good leg. So we're not sure about rehab and repairing that hip and such. We go Wednesday to um, the orthopedic surgeon to have a look at her foot. And uh, God's not surprised. We're trying to figure out the timing. And the timing was to get it done as soon as school's out so she'd be ready for the time school started again three months later. God's not surprised. And I don't know what's happened in your life this week because there's been a lot of things more crazy than our thing. But I know that whatever happened in your life this week, God's not surprised. He's got a plan and a purpose and he's working for that plan and purpose. And the call to us, and we've been trying, is just say, hang on and say, God, what's your plan and purpose here in all this? We don't understand your timing. We don't see it all working out. But we're going to hang on and trust you. Because you've got a plan. And when we look at Jesus' life, and we look at how the Old Testament scriptures played out and into the New Testament, God's not surprised by that. He just was working the plan. Let's trust him to work the plan. And so the third implication of this, it, the test is Jesus. That's the test. The test isn't what other people think of us. The, the test isn't what is going on in the world and how crazy the world seems. The test is, do we believe Jesus when he says that he is the way, the truth, and the life? The test is, do we believe Jesus when he says he's the resurrection and the life? Now that brings up what, when I say the test is Jesus, what's the hardest thing for a person to become a Christian? And that's the word surrender. Because for a person to become a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, they have to surrender some things. They have to surrender maybe the beliefs of their family from the past. They have to surrender uh, a sin that they might happen to be enjoying a little bit more. They have to surrender being the boss and Lord of their life. They have to surrender being the one that calls the shots and makes the decisions and turn it over to Jesus. They have to surrender. And that's tough to do. But what's on the other side of surrender is forgiveness and 
freedom from guilt and shame. What's on the other side of surrender is eternal life. And John 10 later will tell us about abundant life. Aligning with reality. That's what's on the other side of surrender. Would you stand with me, please? With heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder who here today needs to surrender to Christ. You've been calling the shots yourself. But you look at your life and you're like, man, where am I going? I'm kind of spinning my wheels. Because you've been calling the shots yourself. And today is the call to surrender to Jesus Christ. God in heaven, across this room, there's any numbers of folks that need to surrender their lives to you. They've been the boss. They've been calling the shots for way too long. And maybe, God, the scriptures have become clear to somebody today about who Jesus is and giving their life to him. How I pray that today is the breakthrough spiritually for dozens of people. In Jesus' name.